Good day, everybody. Welcome to Rocky Mountain Readings, where last week we finished uh, uh, the wonderful book, uh, Everyday Holiness, uh, a Jewish spiritual uh, 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 user, and uh, I found the book very excellent. weekly uh, and daily schedule, uh, which is just a wonderful opportunity that if you begin to practice, integrate uh, holiness into your life every day and overcome a lot of uh, uh, traits that might need to be overcome. Very, It was a very, very wonderful book by Alan uh, Marinas, who is the founder of the Mooser Society. Uh, excellent, excellent stuff. But today we got something new for you. We thought we'd change it up a bit. We're going to go with Mystic Tales from the Zohar uh, with the commentary by um, Aria Weinman. Um, I was doing some research. I thought it'd be good to change it up. I'm not a big person who's into Kabbalah. It's just not my forte. I think those that pursue that vein uh, with uh, exuberance uh, are just people that want to stick out their hand and grab something that's may maybe not for them. Uh, but they just believe that their desire uh, rules and uh, they're going to use it to get whatever the heck they want. But uh, I thought that this might be a, a general overview of uh, some of the uh, 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 Kabbalistic principles, but uh, we might get stories. So Shalom, Sheila, nice to have you with us. We hope you had a wonderful birthday on the weekend. Um, well, yeah, we've got to chat again soon for sure. Blessing to you. Glad you're here, as always. And uh, yeah, so let's just jump right in. We're going to jump into this new book, Mystic Tales from the Zohar, and uh, let's see how uh, uh, this fares. It's nowhere near as large a book as the last one we read. Um, introduction on the Zoharic story. The Zohar, or the word itself means brilliant light, is a Jewish medieval mystic text that appeared in the late 13th century Christian Spain. It was written in an artificial Aramaic masking a medieval Hebrew. It's a collection of mystical writings, including the homiletic commentary on the Torah. The author wrote the Zohar in a, a pseudepigraphical work, claiming it to be the composition or statement of the teachings and revelations given to Rabbi Simeon Bar Yochai, a second century Talmudic sage. Uh, for this reason, the Zohar is written in Aramaic, uh, the language of the greater part of the Talmud, largely as a result of the Gershom Sh uh, Sholem's monumental research on the subject, contemporary critical scholars virtually unanimously believe the major part of the Zohar to be the work of Moses ben Shem Tov of Lyon. Uh, the Zohar came to acquire virtual canonical status within the world of Kabbalah, which during the 16th through 18th centuries came to comprise almost all of world Jewry. In the 19th century, the Zohar was severely uh, denigrated by rationalist Western Judaism. Uh, the leading Jewish historian of the time, uh, Heinrich uh, Greitz, uh, called it a book of falsehoods because of a growing appreciation of Jewish mysticism. Today, the Zohar is more readily seen as a remarkable text of pronounced poetic qualities and as a vast symbolic complex conveying a distinct and even profound mode of spirituality. At the core of the Zohar is a theosophical view of being. It focuses upon the dynamic inner life of the divine and upon the drama accompanying the emanations of aspects of the divine being and personality uh, in the Sephirot, all contained within the infinite Godhead far beyond the grasp of human thought. The Zoharic drama leaves room uh, for the demonic alongside the holy and depicts the higher realms of being reflected in everything we experience in the world known to us uh, through images of interrelationships of aspects of the divine that underlie our world. The Zoharic cosmic picture abounds with images of separation and danger of exile and longing, of love, ecstasy, union, and oneness. The remarkable literary richness of the Zohar likely accounts in part for the singular, exalted place the book attained within the world of Kabbalah. The Zohank writer grasped the world 
and the world through the lens of an extravagantly colorful, even exotic imagination. The Zohar's theosophical teaching approaches the ultimate issues of existence, not in terms of abstract concepts, but rather in a manner akin to narrative. Its discourse comprises a vast story centered around the pulsating inner life of the divine being, the ultimate reality. At times, its lengthy homiletic passages are highly descriptive and possess a pronounced lyrical tone. These qualities make the Zohar a kind of expansive prose poem, the fruit of an almost unbounded imagination that draws from layer upon layer of earlier Jewish lore, adding to them the Zohar's own mythic nuances and themes, probably no other text in the annals of Jewish writing and thought so abounds in archetypal motifs and mythic images and themes. And the Zohar, in this sense, reflects aspects of a culture pattern underlying a vast diversity of religions and cultures. The tendency to absorb within itself so much that it is archetypal in nature, crossing religious and cultural boundaries, could be a factor. We dare to suggest in the Zohar's ultimately ambiguous relationship to that larger world of religious imagination and myth lying beyond the orbits of Jewish monotheistic belief. Midrash and myth meet in the text of the Zohar. Within its framework of homilies, comprising a mystical theosophical commentary on many verses of the Torah, the Zohar contains numerous narrative passages. Many of these are quite fragmentary in nature and serve merely as a narrative framework for the idea, ideational content included in that particular section. Other narratives, however, display considerable literary complexity and power. In the Zohar, the medieval Jewish story acquired wings and reached unprecedented heights. This is a case, even considering the Zohar's own professed denigration of narrative, something the Zohar shared with other voices in the medieval Jewish world. While the Zohar has been the subject of most impressive research, Up to the present time, little had been written on the stories found within the text of the Zohar. The tendency in Zohar scholarship has long been, in fact, to minimize the importance of the stories within the Zohar in relation to scholarly concerns and investigations. Currently, however, greater attention is being focused upon the stories as a subject of research, making for a re-evaluation of the Zoharic story and its importance within the Zohar. The reader will note that the more complex and developed Zoharic stories exemplify significant literary art. This study will take note both of narrative art within the story and the art of the larger homiletic composition, in which the story integrates with the non-narrative content of the homilies. In some cases, these stories are are multi-thematic, and different themes are accentuated or alluded to in different elements and on different levels in the narrative. In the Zoharic story, at its best, the author conveys a multitude of meanings, voices, various codes, and utilizes a number of literary and narrative strategies. Shalom, Ashley G. Welcome. A fuller understanding of these stories requires a familiarity with the particular complex of symbolism that informs the Zohar. It also requires that the reader listen carefully to the details and nuances of the relationship to its larger compositional unit, the Zoharic uh, Darush or homily. These stories have a definite textual context from which they cannot be shorn, and a story's multiple connections on various levels with the larger non-narrative text are indispensable in defining the meaning of the story itself. In addition, we shall read these stories with an eye to the insights they might suggest concerning the underlying mindset of the Zoharic author, his premises and attitudes, and presumably those of his circle and his spiritual world. Often, the inner narrative logic of a story mirrors basic beliefs and reflects a particular temperament. The stories illumine the Zoharic mystic self-perception, his reflections concerning himself, his situation, and his writings, sometimes upon examination, the ultimate subject of a story appears to be the Zohar itself. A Zoharic narrative might convey the ephemeral nature of mystic insight. 
the virtual impossibility of attaining mystic knowledge in tradition. The informed reader, the author assumed, was quite aware of the older source obliquely present in the narrative, and the recognition of the source sometimes evokes an implied comparison vital to the meaning of the latter story. When the Zoharic story recalls a biblical narrative, the tradition of interpretation of that older story becomes an implicit part of the foreground of the Zoharic tale as well. One story of King Solomon found in a strand of Zoharic literature represents a striking example of the retelling of older stories or folk motifs. Each morning, Solomon would ascend upon a large eagle and fly to a place in, a dark, in the dark mountains of the wilderness to learn magic arts. The motif of a magic bird or carpet placed at the wise king's service, however, dissolves as Solomon views on his flight the place of those who have died in earliest infancy. The theme of magic power thoroughly recedes before the uh, recognition of tragedy as Hashem is overcome with pity for the children who are torn from their families at the tender age, children for whom there is no comfort. Their tears move all the world to weeping from Sava uh, de Mishpatim. Uh, the folk character of an earlier motif has been radically transformed. One type of intertextuality encountered in the reading of Zoharic stories is evident in the profusion of biblical verses quoted in the narrative texts. They lend to the Zoharic narrative the qualities of a, a Midrashic story. A story might appear to elucidate a biblical verse, or the latter might appear as a proof text to clinch the implications of the particular story. Or a biblical verse, even a single word from a verse, might sometimes serve to evoke or occasion a story. The biblical verses quoted within the Zoharic narrative passage are an integral aspect of the story text and often crucially illumine the story. A biblical verse quoted at the closure of a narrative passage might alter the reader's grasp of the entire elements of a biblical verse is resolved when death is understood not as an occasion of grief with its potentially destructive practices that the Torah prohibits, but rather as one of joy. Many of the above functions are quite common in classical Midrashic texts, but an additional strategy that stands out in the Zohar is the role afforded associations from classical Midrashic readings in the use of a biblical verse. Some significant examples of this function of the quoted biblical verse are clearly evident in the account of the death of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, uh, a composition included in the text of the Zohar. The sage's death comes after his disclosure of the most sublime mysteries to the Idrazuta, a small holy assembly. Seven mystic sages who have survived the death of three of their colleagues in the wake of previous disclosures made during the Id Idra Rabba the large holy assembly. The Idra Zuta is included in the Zohar's exegesis when the beer of Rabbi Simon rises in the air, a voice is heard inviting all to join in the wedding feast of Rabbi Simeon. The voice utters the verse from Isaiah 57 too. He comes in peace, they shall rest upon their beds. In Devarim Rabbo 11.10, this verse too is related to the death of Moses. The heavens wept, the earth wept, and when Joshua was seeking his master and unable to find him, he also wept. Uh, the angels together with Israel then utter the words from Isaiah. Midrashic readings of a number of verses quoted following the death of the three sages of the large holy assembly, foreshadowing the death of bar Yochai, similarly recall associations with Moses and his death. Uh, after their sudden deaths, the three sages are carried by angels into a canopy spread out above them, where their souls make their departure with a kiss. A comment recalling the death of Moses according to a rabbinic tradition. Three uh, pertinent biblical verses stand out in this passage. Rabbi Simeon refers to himself and his six fellows, the survivors, in the quoting verse from the prophet's vision of the the menorah in Zechariah 4.10. These seven are the eyes of the Lord. Rabbi Abba immediately recalls that six of the lamps of the temple menorah received their light from the seventh. 
Bar Yochai occupying the position of the seventh in the analogy. As the seventh, Bar Yochai is further referred to as the Sabbath of us all, the one day that blesses the other days of the week and is uniquely holy among them. A comment recorded in Yalkut Shimoni uh, 2, verse 570, explains the seven eyes of the Lord mentioned in Zechariah as corresponding to the fathers through Moses. As Moses is the seventh in a list of biblical figures which directly links Abraham with Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Levi, Kehat, Abraham, and Moses. These uh, midrashic overtones of a single verse elucidate three parallel and interconnecting series of seven. The candlelights in the temple menorah, the seventh day and the weekdays, and Moses standing as the principal of the important biblical figures beginning with Abraham. A discussion in the same Zoharic passage touching on the central role of the seventh day includes words from Genesis 2, verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. The Zohar text again likens Rabbi Simon Bar Yochai to the seventh day, crowned and hallowed above the other days of the week, and again the verse connotes a connection via Midrashic reading of Vayikra Rabbah 29.11 with Moses. The Midrashic passage there explains that all sevenths are favored and that among the fathers, the seventh was Moses, the favorite in Hashem's eyes. By evoking Midrashic readings, these and other verses create an implicit archi- ar- architectonic network to buttress the Zohar's attribution to Rabbi Simeon Bar Yochai, the spiritual level and significance of Moses. Through it, the author portrays the death of Bar Yochai and also of his students as a distinct parallel to the death of Moses. The same biblical verses relating to the Sabbath are read in Midrashic sources in a way which accentuates the Jewish character of the seventh day, likens it to a wedding, and stresses the the prohibition of mourning on that day The various overtones interweave. Rabbi Simeon is likened to the seventh day on which there is no mourning. Hence, his death should be regarded as an occasion not of mourning, but of joy. Also, like the seventh day, the death of Rabbi Simeon is described in terms of a wedding feast. With the death of such a person, the culmination and total effect of his life, his deeds, and his mystical insights affect a divine wedding in the higher worlds, a union between masculine and feminine powers within the Godhead. We have observed here that a biblical verse quoted story might be located in its overtones and hence remains on the level of illusion. At this level, the Zoharic art of biblical quotation belongs to the realm of the poetic. Even more complex Zoharic stories are not set apart in any clear way from the text surrounding them. Consequently, though, a narrative can be grasped in terms of its story pattern. It can still lack a clearly defined beginning or concluding point within the larger text. The story appears to merge with its landscape and with the texture of its context, with what precedes and follows without any sharp lines of demarcation. A story might relate either explicitly or more subtly to any point in the larger homiletic text in which it is located. Consequently, its background, though distinctly non-narrative in nature, is often integral to the body of the story. For example, in a passage interpreting the verse which states that Moses came to Horeb, the mountain of God, from Exodus 3.1, the question is raised, how was Moses able to identify the mountain? It is first explained that the birds flew in the air, encompassing the mountain with wings outstretched but never flying over the mountain. It is then mentioned that Moses noticed birds flying toward him from the direction of the mountain and falling at his feet. Realizing the special character of the mountain, he led his flocks of sheep to a point in the distance and proceeded to ascend the mountain alone. The motif of the birds directing him to the mountain site in one way or another echoes the subject of birds earlier in the Zoharic discussions of the same Torah portion. There, the text mentions that both birds, wings, and children might proclaim an imminent change in political power decreed first in the other world, the Messiah's concealment in the chamber known as the bird's nest. 
is also mentioned, and the name is explained in that the Shekinah, the aspect of the Godhead, larger homiletic texts, connections with elements that might either precede, be situated within, or follow the story. Another essential characteristic observed in certain Zoharic stories is a distinct tendency to encompass within a story the totality of history, even the totality of cosmic history, as grasped by Kabbalah. A single story or parable sometimes represents a vast canvas that includes all of time from the very beginning of things until the hour of redemption, much as contemporary astronomers have produced a drawer-sized map of the entire physical universe. As an example, let us refer to one such narrative passage that connects several strands in a way to comprise the totality of human history. A Zoharic story, 319, relates that Lilith, the female personification of the evil, demonic forces, cohabited with Adam before his body received a soul. Then when Adam's body, containing both its male and female sides, received a soul, his female self was fashioned into Eve, whom God brought to Adam like a bride to the canopy. Lilith filled, fled to the cities of the coast where she remains to the present time. There, from the seacoast, suggesting the boundary between order and chaos, Lilith attempts to entice Adam's descendants. The time of enticements and human failures is equated with the span of human history, and the passage then leaps to what will follow when God will destroy Rome and will proceed to settle Lilith there among its ruins, as she is the ruin of the world. The destruction and ruins of Jerusalem are mirrored inversely in this apocalyptic event. The devastation of Rome, the city which symbolizes the power that so oppressed Israel and had destroyed Jerusalem. The span of time encompasses, encompassed in this brief story concerning Lilith extends from before Adam received a soul to the redemptive writing of the wrongs of history. From the very beginning to the very end of the human story. The story leaps, however, from the beginning to the time of redemption with only implied mention of the intervening historical time as a span in which Lilith entices humankind to sin. Another example of this type of story encompasses an en encompassing an entire history is the Zoharic parable of a king angered by the behavior of his beloved only son. The king strikes the son, but then forgives him. When the son persists in his notorious behavior, the father drives him from the house, and the son, away from the palace, turns to a decidedly immoral life. In response to the queen's weeping, the king's office offers to restore him to the pal uh, palace in a manner in eliciting no attention, in keeping with the king's honor, which was shamed by his son's conduct, and gives the queen full responsibility for him. Once again, the son sins, and this time his father expels both the son and his mother. For if, the, if mother and son are to suffer together, the king knows that his son will repent. If the illusions are not sufficiently transparent, the text that follows explains the parable as referring to Egyptian bondage, the Babylonian exile, the return from exile without any fanfare similar to the miracle at the, Red, at the Sea of Reeds and the latter exile at the hands of Rome. While the illusions chronologically terminate at that point, the king's intent implies also the redemption to come. The entire history of Israel is encapsulated in this brief parable of a king, his son, and his son's mother. At the same time, the parable's illusions interpret the happenings of Israel's history through reference to another dimension of being. Interwoven with historical experience is the drama of the exile of the Shekinah separated from the masculine powers within the realm of divinity. Human sin is viewed as a cause of displacement both within human history and within the higher levels of being. This parable is one of a series of parables found in different places within the Zohar, which speaks of the interrelationships of a king, his wife, and their son and of one relationship affecting another within this triad. 
The context of this parable is the apparent contradiction between the biblical promise to Israel and Israel's historic historical reality as a small and subject people. The inner dialect of the parable, however, points to a larger apparent contradiction between the judgment Israel has experienced in its exile and divine compassion. Focusing upon this same parable more closely, the reader notes two contrasting tendencies, one making for distance and remoteness, the other making for nearness and presence. The former exemplifies the father who decrees exile for his son and who, while initially saddened, does not succumb to weeping for him. The latter tendency exemplifies the mother ceaselessly weeping and pleading for her exiled son. That very polarity, however, is transcended. The former tendency making for distance, remoteness, and exile is ultimately designed to achieve a state of true closeness between father and son. The son's mother is exiled in order to ensure their reunion as a family. Exile is decreed for the purpose of annihilating the roots of exile in the son's behavioral pattern, his propensity to sin. Behind the face of harsh judgment, the parable perceives divine compassion. Wow, what a, what a notion uh, over such a vast expanse. You can see why it's so embedded in the Jewish people about being restored. <clears throat> the turning point in the parable is the exile of the prince's mother, which concludes the story. What follows is the stating of an expectation and intent. The son's repentance and restoration to the palace is merely implied. But what is implied, nevertheless, comprises part of the total pattern of the story, the totality of history it signifies, the implied redemption and restoration serve, in fact, as the more decisive turning point, even though they lie beyond the sequence of events comprising the story, as told, the story's extension to redemption, even by implication, is most significant in illuminating both its character and the actual canvas of time it reflects. Wow, what a writing style. The parallels between the Shekinah and uh, Mary notwithstanding, of course, obvious and essential differences, might also include shared elements in the symbolism of the two. Both the rose and the garden symbolize the Shekinah in the Zohar. Mary, too, is specifically identified with roses and gardens, and her association as a rosa mystica accounts for the term rosary, prayer beads used when Catholics pray to Mary. In examining the stories in this collection, we will occasionally note other parallels suggesting the effect of a common landscape, one reflected both in the Zohar and in the emerging Spanish literature of the same period. But let us return to our basic idea at this point. In his book, Anatomy of Criticism, the noted critic Northrop Fry speaks of the encyclopedic form, consisting often of collections of tales, myths, epics, and chronicles that join together to form aggregates. Those aggregates represent, according to Fry, a totality of time and experience extending from creation to apocalypse. The Bible for Fry exemplifies this kind of an encyclopedic structure, a total myth culminating with a redeemed world. In different modes, various kinds of literary works serve as analogous to the Bible in this respect and exemplify in their own terms its encyclopedic quality and character built around five basic events, creation, fall, exile, redemption, and restoration. Considered as a literary work, the Zohar exemplifies this uh, encyclopedic character. A sense of the totality of time and experience pervades the Zohar, even though the Zohar does not express this sense in any systematic or chronological arrangement. The Zohar indeed reflects a much vaster canvas than does the Bible. It begins not with the creation of our universe, but rather with the initial stirring within the Ein Sof, within the infinite divine being. That stirring affected a chain of development accounting ultimately for both the emanation of the narrative content. The result is an encyclopedic story. More often, the encyclopedic quality radiates from other narratives in the Zohar constructed upon a much more limited time frame, but nevertheless, presupposing and alluding to a larger total story, 
and to the conflict that permeates it. We note, for example, on account of the desert dweller, <clears throat> a rather marginal story in terms of its narrative qualities, yet this same account conveys an infinitely larger story stretching from the triumph of the evil forces, a consequence of making of the golden calf, to the implied point of redemption time in the future. In that redemptive moment, the evil forces will be removed as a consequence of the mystic activity of the sage residing in the desert. The scene of darkness, an almost uh, hermit-like sage, seeks to negate that triumph of the strata adra, the demonic and impure forces that an, at an earlier hour of history. These stories might comprise a, a key element in the Zohar's acceptance within the world of Kabbalah, in effect, as a canonical text. Over 500 years after the Zohar was written, a similar grasp of total experience in narrative form marks the tales of Rabbi Nachman of Breslev. On one level, these tales, which also draw upon the Zohar's words of imagery, portray a historic of a history of the cosmos in terms of the worldview of Luriana Kabbalah, a later stage in the history of Jewish mysticism. They mirror the conception of a history extending from the initial act of a contraction within the infinite divine being through cosmic catastrophe to a future redemption, a mending of the estrangement and exile at the heart of being. That sense of totality in all encompassing sacred story and fry sense might be crucial in explaining why those tales of Rabbi Nachman uh, came to be regarded by its followers on par virtually with Scripture. Much more recently, Moshe Idel subsequently questions Moshe de Leon's authorship of the Zohar by contrasting aspects of the Zohar with concepts in Moshe de Leon's Hebrew writings as an inquiry concerning the authorship of the Zohar is not within the boundaries of this study. We shall refer to the writer simply as the Zoharic author. The surface dimension of the Torah, one likened to a mere garment concealing the Torah's mystic essence. See uh, Joseph Dan uh, Hasipur Ha Ivri Bimi. Anyways, the professed deflation of narrative in these passages might actually be somewhat deceiving as they nonetheless affirm the capacity of the story to serve as a garment of ultimate truth. While the philosophical strain in Spanish or Spanish Jewish culture, highly abstract in character, was critical of and even embarrassed by Agadah, i.e. the traditions of Jewish lore, including its narrative expressions hardly appropriate to a systematic, coherent, or rational worldview, the Zohar represents a rebirth of Agadah and its undisciplined imagination. Four, the basic findings are summarized in uh, Shkolem, uh, Major Trends, Lectures 5 and 6 in Isaiah, Tishbi, Introduction to the Mishnat HaZohar. Um, okay, so he's just citing more. Let's see if we can get to. Grief, Triumph, Expulsion. A student's grief over Simon Bar Yochai's death gives way to a vision of the sage in the Celestial Academy, followed in turn by the dis disciple's expulsion from the very setting of the vision. Rabbi Hia bent down to the ground and bowed, kissing the dust and weeping. He cried out, Dust, dust, how utterly stubborn you are, how brazen you are, that in you all the delights of the eye wear out in a state of oblivion. All the pillars of light in the world you extinguish and shatter. Indeed, how very brazen are you. For the holy light that illumined the world, the great master through whose merit the world continues to exist, decays and wears away within you. Rabbi Simeon, the very light of light, the light of the worlds, you perished in the dust, you who are responsible for sustaining the world. Completely beside himself for a moment, he exclaimed, Dust, dust, be not proud for the pillars of the world will not be delivered into your hands. Rabbi Simeon will not wear away in you. Still weeping, Rabbi Chia stood up and began walking together with Rabbi Yossi. Beginning that day, he fasted for a total of 40 days, with the hope of being able to see Rabbi Simeon in a vision. But instead he was told, you are not
Rabbi, he, wait, you were, I'm sorry, I don't know why this, you were not permitted to see him. He wept and fasted another 40 days. Then in a vision, he saw Rabbi Simeon with his son, Rabbi Eliezer, with thousands listening to his words as they were conversing on the very subject on which Rabbi Yossi himself had just spoken. He noticed many large winged heavenly beings upon whose wings Rabbi Simeon and his son, Rabbi Eliezer, rose up to the celestial academy of the heavenly firmament where those winged angels proceeded to wait for them. He perceived that the sages appeared brighter and brighter until their light was even more dazzling than that of the sun. Rabbi Simeon then announced, Let Rabbi Chia enter and observe how the Holy One, blessed be he, will, in the future, renew the countenance of the righteous. Blessed is the one who has entered here without disgrace, and blessed is the one who, in that other world, stands as a pillar of spiritual strength. Such longing and every day while in that other world can have no place here. Meanwhile, he noted several Devarim, all those mighty pillars gathering around, and he observed that they were lifted up to the heavenly academy. They were ascending while others were descending. And he saw the angel who come, came and swore that from behind the veil, he had heard that each day the king remembers and visits the gazelle who is lying in the dust. At that moment, the king strikes all 390 firmaments, which then all tremble and shake before his presence. Tears as hot as fire well up in his eyes and fall to the great sea. From those tears, the master of the sea emerges, the one who, hallowing the name of the Holy One, agrees to swallow all the waters of creation. He will absorb them within himself at the very time that all the nations will gather against the holy people so that the waters might part and the people pass through on dry land. Hezekiah, king of Judah, and in that of uh, Ahia Hashiloni, I myself have not come to pr approve the Torah of your academy, but the presiding angel has come here, and I know that he will not enter into any other academy but yours. At that very hour, Rabbi Simeon told him what he had heard under oath from the angel. Immediately, the Messiah, totally agitated, raised his voice, causing the firmaments to tremble along with the great sea and Leviathan too, and the foundations of the world were beginning to shake. While all this was happening, the Messiah noticed Rabbi Chia seated at the feet of Rabbi Simeon. He asked, who brought you here, one who is still clad in a garment of that other world? Shalom, Imam Pamuji. Rabbi Simeon explained, it is Rabbi Hia, the light of the lamp of the Torah. The Messiah told him in that case, let him, let him, I don't know if this is jumping. Let him and his sons undergo death, be gathered in and be accepted as members of your academy. At this, Rabbi Simeon requested, grant him time before that occurs. And so time was granted to him, and he departed, trembling, tears falling from his eyes. Shaking and weeping, Rabbi Hia said, Truly blessed is the portion of the righteous in that world, and especially blessed is the portion of Bar Yochai. Concerning just that kind of reward, it is written, I endow those who love me with substance, I will fill their treasures. From Proverbs 8.21 Notes The scholars of Torah who are likened to pillars upholding the universe. Baba Metzia 85a mentions the practice of fasting for a period of 40 days. According to the Torah, Moses upon Mount Sinai neither ate nor drank for that period of time. Exodus 34, 28. A source in Kohelet Rabbah on Ecclesiastes 9.10 speaks of fasting for the purpose of seeing in a dream a sage who had died. Uh, Moshe Idol in Kabbalah New Perspectives, 77 to 88, he has traced examples of self-induced weeping as a mystical practice in order to obtain a vision or dream. This practice, Idol points out, is sometimes connected with visiting a gravesite, uh, an association of direct uh, relevance to the setting of the first part of his narrative. The mystic signi significance of the first two words of the Torah as discussed by Rabbi Yossi 
the discussion of the very same subject in the Heavenly Academy is the direct link between this account and its textual context. Five, only those who had died an earthly death were capable of beholding the great light in all its brightness. Six, through their deeds they have transformed judgment into mercy. After the exodus from Egypt, uh, the miraculous occurrence regarded as the prototype of the redemption to come from Isaiah 11.15, the substance of his teaching, the figure 300 represents the first three sephirot, with 70 signifying the lower seven sephirot that emanated from them. The number that represents the sum of the mitzvot commandments found in the Torah and also the limbs and sinews of the human body. Uh, King of Judah during the latter part of the 8th century in latter Jewish tradition, he is portrayed as righteous and devout ruler who devoted uh, to the study of Torah, promoted the study of Torah tradition. According to the Sanhe Sanhedrin, Hezekiah is a messianic figure. See Yehuda uh, Liebs, a biblical prophet from the period preceding the literary prophets. He survived during the reign of Solomon and played a role in political affairs after Solomon's death. In Kabbalistic lore, he is portrayed as a teacher of mystic tradition. 18, the physical body and the accompanying mental faculties and physiological makeup associated with and dependent upon the body, literally, be gathered in, to be gathered to one's people, is a biblical expression for death. And he cites it from Genesis 25, 35, 49, and 29. 20, referring to treasures of wisdom, Moses Cordovero Chapter 8 of Proverbs is devoted in its entirety to the importance of words of wisdom and to the reward for fulfilling them. In later sources, the verse is understood as relating to the reward of the righteous in the world to come. See Mishnah 3.12 in uh, Peshikta Derev uh, Kahana 200b. The verse refers to Moses' reward following his death. Elsewhere in the Zohar, the verse is understood as the world to come. It is also specified in the Zohar that the verse suggests 310 numerical value of yesh substance, worlds that God has prepared for the delight of the righteous in the world to come, based on Sanhedrin 100a. Note, this story from the Zohar was later uh, recreated in a legend told about the Baal Shem Tov, one that invites comparison with the Zoharic source. The Hasidic legend appears in Jacob and Israel, uh, Berger, uh, Tarret, Yaakov, uh, Ve Yisrael, 50, page 53 and 54, with the claim that it was copied from an older old letter dated 1798-1799. A partial English translation of that Hasidic legend is found in Abraham Joshua Heschel's The Circle of the Bel Shem Tov, Studies in Hasidism, Studies in Hasidim, page 145. Commentary. The wondrous nature of the teachings of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai relating to the opening word and echo from one section to another, making for a cohesiveness in the account as a whole. First comes the elegiac opening, this section depicting the aftermath of the death of Bar Yochai, strikes a note both of deep grief and of deep humility as Rabbi Hia kisses the dust in response to his teacher's death. This act, in addition, also connotates death by means of a kiss, a dying that transcends or avoids the bitter nature and experience of death as we know it. While in Jewish tradition, this kind of death is associated primarily with that of Moses. In the Zohar, it is associated also with Bar Yochai and with three of his students who similarly die in a state of total cleaving to Hashem. Bending down to kiss the dust, Rabbi Hia is transported upward in a visionary ascent to the heavenly academy. That opening passage, so uh, elegiac in character, is both a response to the death of Bar Yochai and a broader statement on the nature of death. <clears throat> This word Zohar itself as light, brightness, splendor is an uh, elegiac story relating to the death of Rabbi Eliezer, the great 
found in the earlier stratum of the Zohar. Uh, Rabbi Akiva, hearing words of the sage's death, tore his clothing and cried, Heavens, heavens, tell the sun and the moon that the light which was greater than they has become darkened. After the uh, elegiac opening, Rabbi Hia's frame of mind changes as he de defiantly defy denies the right of death to have such effect. Refuting that power of death, he cried out, Dust, dust, be not proud, words that distinctly recall to the modern reader those of the English poet John Doan. With this transformation of mood, the first of the two turning points in the passage, Rabbi Hia's wish is granted, and he receives a vision of Bar Yochai with his son in the Heavenly Academy, where deceased scholars study after death, whereas darkness holds sway in this world. The echoes of that of Rabbi Hia at the, the story's opening, prior to his vision of Bar Yochai in the Heavenly Academy, just as the dust in which the Shekinah is trodden recalls Rabbi Hia's kissing the dust in his state of grief. The sorrowful divine secret serves as a very precise narrative connection. Hashem weeps, and the Messiah, hearing the divine weeping, vents his anger. And it is within that expression of his anger that the Messiah takes note of Rabbi Hia, a person of this world who is present there in the scene of the heavenly academy. The Messiah's anger colors his questioning of Rabbi Hia, and it is Rabbi Simeon bar Yochai who argue, who assuages that anger on the part of the Messiah, which is now directed towards the former student. As a dream vision in which Rabbi Hia is the beholder and dreamer, the vision ultimately illumines not the destiny and lot of Rabbi Simeon, but rather that of Rabbi Hia and represents the ex existential condition of the mystic in this world. The Messiah takes note of Rabbi Hia as still clad in the garments of that other world, garments consisting of a physical body and of those levels of the soul that relate to material existence. When Rabbi Simeon refers to the high level of Rabbi Hia and of his teachings, the Messiah responds by offering to make Rabbi Hia and his sons official members of the Heavenly Academy. Let them be gathered, he says, the latter verb can, connoting death. Uh, acceptance would necessarily involve his proceeding through the passageway of death, since the experience of the higher world is not for those who still belong to this world. During the course of the narrative, the focus has shifted from the death of Rabbi Simeon to Rabbi Hia's own death, which is postponed. Only later upon his death in its own time will Rabbi Hia be able to enter as a member of the Heavenly Academy. Rabbi Simeon's earlier ordering allowing Rabbi Hia to enter is seen in retrospect to be highly problematic as even he lacks that authority, and the Messiah's condition for he is remaining in the heavenly academy recalls, in part, the mood of the earlier announcement to Rabbi Hia following his first 40-day fast, you are not permitted. The narrative recalls a number of Talmudic passages, the association of Rabbi Hia with, it, with the scene of the heavenly academy might well stem from a story in which Elijah warns a sage that thought he might see the chariots of the departed scholars as they ascend to the heavenly academy. He should not look at the carriage of Rabbi Hia, for its brightness will blind him. Elijah, in the Talmudic passage, explained furthermore that while other carriages are accompanied by angels, that of Rabbi Hia has no need of angels to direct its movements. The Messiah's reaction to the presence of Rabbi Hia in the Heavenly Academy recalls another Talmudic legend, in which the angels reacted similarly to Moses when he ascended to the upper world to receive the Torah. What is one born of woman doing among us? In that Agadah attributed to Rabbi Joshua ben Levi, Hashem then ordered Moses to justify to the angels his giving the infinitely precious Torah to flesh and blood. Our story recalls in tradition another Talmudic legend, told about the same Rabbi Joshua, Joshua ben Levi just before the time of death designated for him. It is told the angel of death was ordered first to grant whatever wishes the sage might request. 
When approached by the angel of death, Rabbi Joshua ben Levi requested to see his place in the other world. When the angel of death consented, the sage requested in addition that the angel of death give him his knife so that he would not be frightened along the way. This too was granted. Arriving in paradise, the sage, noting his place, jumped over the wall into the Garden of Eden and swore to the angel of death that he would not return. Only upon a command uttered by the heavenly voice, but Kol, did Rabbi Joshua ben Levi return the knife to the angel of death, who needed it to fulfill his required tasks. Elijah, the legend continues, greeted the sage, announcing, Make room for the son of Levi, who, interestingly, for our purposes, then found Rabbi Simeon bar Yochai in paradise, seated upon thirteen tables or stools of pure gold. Hey, Dave Tuttle and Dewey, welcome. Another Talmudic legend tells of the Babylonian scholar Rabbi Ben Nahamani, an authority on laws relating to the skin affliction Sarat, who was called to the Heavenly Academy to decide a particular case about which the Holy One, blessed be he, and the sages could not agree. Upon being called to the Academy, Rabbi Ben Nahamani died, and at the moment of death he uttered his answer, resolving the legal question. In a Kabbalistic text that appeared sometime in the 14th century, and hence later than the Zohar, it is told that Elijah brought the sage Elkanah to the heavenly academy where the angels became incensed at one born of a woman in their midst. In this legend found in the introduction to Sefer Hapalia and likely based upon the Zoharic story we are discussing, Elkanah became terrified and requested that Elijah bring him back to earth. These various legends represent a number of different scenarios involving a sage from this world present in the heavenly academy or in the world to come. Rabbi Joshua ben Levi was allowed to remain and hence to avoid experiencing death whereas Rabban bar Nahamani died when there was need for his knowledge in the heavenly academy. The Zoharic writer recast the basic shared outlines of these, le- of these legends, choosing as his own option an order of expulsion. Prevel- oh. Oh. Spanish literature okay, wait, 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 wait. of the 13th century included a striking parallel to the sage's expulsion from the heavenly academy, until his proper time of death. Based upon an older Latin account of St. Oria, Gonzola de Barcio, Vida di Santa Oria, describes the saint's visionary ascent to heaven, where, seeing her reward in the symbol of a throne, she is told that she must nevertheless return to earth and continue her ascetic life until her death. Lacking any choice, she accepts this message with pronounced sadness, her vision, interestingly, includes a description of exceedingly luminous gems. The emphasis within the description given to winged heavenly beings populating the scene of the heavenly academy has an archetypal ring which suggests a very different vantage point. The world to come. Uh, yeah. Alchemist Synonymous. Yeah, the heavenly academy is talking about the world after death. Or, yeah, where 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 the soul goes after death has an archetypal ring which suggests a very different vantage point from which to read this story. The pattern of mystic flight symbolized by wings and winged beings and the access to the upper world and its celestial academy prior to physical death recall a recall a prevalent complex in primitive religion, one given most compact from form in the otherworldly journey of the shaman dependent upon ecstatic trance. Such a comparison does not suggest any direct contact with or influence of shamanism. However, the parallel might bring some of the contours of the story into sharper focus. The shaman was able to enter the realm of the departed of or of celestial beings without actually shedding his physical form through the impetus of his ecstatic trance. He was able to penetrate the bounds of earthly life without dying. Placed against the image of that widespread religious complex, the story of Rabbi Hia emphatically denies the possibility of mortal being 
allowed to transcend earthly bounds without first undergoing death. If the shaman's ecstatic trance enabled his journey, Rabbi Hia's expulsion signifies a bursting of that ecstasy which accompanied his visionary experience of ecstatic brightness. He is banished from ecstasy itself and exiled to an earthbound reality. This expulsion from ecstasy flows, we, are, we note in the narrative form, the realization of an unredeemed world, and moreover, an unredeemed, divi- an un- unredeemed divinity as evident in the exile of the Shekinah. It is this encounter, even amid such effulgence, with the fact of an unredeemed world that removes the mystic from his visionary world. The vision in the Zohar accounts serves to confirm the truth and the exalted worth of the teachings of Bar Yochai. In this sense, it stands as a confirmation of the Zohar itself, which claims to include Bar Yochai's teaching and revelations. The seal of approval that the Messiah and the angel identified in his commentaries as Metatron place upon the teachings of Bar Yochai constitute a seal of approval for the Zohar. In Heavenly Academy of Bar Yochai, the reader understand understands it is Kabbalah that is studied, the same Kabbalah through with greater access to the mystic truth studied in this world. If this be the case, then the experience of Rabbi Hia in the higher worlds, including the experience of expulsion, holds true for every devotee to the same mystic truth on this side of eternity. The student of Kabbalah has taught has caught a glimpse of the bliss of a higher realm without having passed through the gateway of death. He has wandered into a realm of awesome radiance beyond the sphere where one can normally journey while still in a human state. Such a person is as one who has intruded into an alien realm. And having caught a glimpse of the higher world, he no longer fully belongs to this world. The devotee is essentially like Rabbi Chia at the end of the account, a person suspended between two worlds and consequently alien to both. The motif of a prince of the sea in the story appears as a remnant of much older traditions, uh, pre-biblical mythological accounts telling of the sea in rebellion against God or a God at the time of creation. According to such ancient myths, it was necessary to vanquish the sea monster, uh, a manifestation of a deity representing chaos. Okay, that's where they get the Leviathan from. In order uh, that the creating deity might proceed to create this world, this mythic contest is known largely from the Babylonian creation account. Uh, Emuna Elish. Echoes of this kind of myth are found not only in biblical poetry, this is important, especially for you know, Christians that hold to their book of revelations. That's where it comes from. Very important to note. <sighs> Echoes of this kind of myth are found not only biblical in biblical poetry, where they serve as poetic embellishments and imagery, but also in Talmudic and Midrashic sources. In Pirkei uh, de Rabbi El- uh, Eliezer, chapter 5, it is related that, the following, that following the formation of dry land, the seas wish once again to regain their former power and to cover the earth. According to Shemot Rabbah 1522, God kills a, the sea monster and a force for chaos along with those waters that have rebelled. The Zoharic passage under discussion would seem to echo that basic motif also found in Baba Batra 74b and Bamidbar Rabbah 1822. There, Hashem is reported as instructing the sea to open his mouth and swallow all the waters of creation. When the sea refuses, Hashem kicks and kills the sea. In the echo of this motif found in the Zoharic story, Right on, uh, Dave Tuttle. He'll be right back. Coffee break. 
In the echo of this motif found in the Zoharic story we are discussing, the sea willingly agrees to Hashem's request that it swallow the waters at the opportune moment. The crossing of the sea upon dry land signals the triumph of Hashem as sole master of the seas and the ultimate triumph of order over chaos. It also symbolizes the redemption to come and the ingathering of exiles from Isaiah 11:15. In a radical transformation, a thoroughly harmonious rendition of the motif of the rebellion of the waters has completely negated the conflict central to that motif, very motif. That's a very important statement, I'm sure. Whoop, go back. That's where, yeah. Another echo of the same ancient motif is evident in the Zoharic passage relating to the aftermath of the making of the golden calf and Moses, of Moses shattering the tablets of the law. The ocean we read there responds by overflowing and flooding the entire world. The waters justly justify their behavior, maintaining that the world and its order existed, exist by virtue of the law, which had now been rejected. Moses, however, through a magical act, is able to prevent the waters from restoring the world to chaos. He takes water from the sea and pours it upon the site where he had burned the molten, the ca- molten calf. Only this act appeases and quiets the waters. Together, these two passages indicate that traces of the ancient tradition of, the, of opposition by waters, one which in its earlier form predates the biblical period and reflects a radically different worldview, are reflected in the lore of the Zohar. Together with the Talmudic legends recalled by certain episodes of the narrative, the echo of ancient myth indicate the many layers of tradition reflected in this story of the aftermath of Bar Yochai's death. Then he's got some notes. You know what? I I think we're going to stop there for today because we're going to get into uh, another story and we'll start that tomorrow. So uh, why don't we just leave it for today and then tomorrow we'll get into the Book of Adam's two accounts. And uh, that sounds so interesting, but I found so far the only notes I've taken have to do with that uh, mythical contest uh, uh, largely from the Babylonian creation account. and it's listed as Enuma Elish, uh, is where that uh, uh, war in heaven, Leviathan uh, uh, notions that the Christians have uh, fully inserted into their book of revelations. Uh, so it's nice to see that there are sources that uh, uh, show the, 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 the falsity of uh, uh, such ideology and views. So hopefully you folks are enjoying this so far, uh, Mystic Tales from the Zohar. Uh, it's different, um, but it's uh, just an introductory exp- ex- exposure to uh, some Kabbalistic thought. I think the author's got a well-established, uh, so far, uh, order. It sounds like he's going to tell us a, a, a story, a tale from the Zohar. Then he's going to go into some detail about it and then some explanation, and it will help us to understand the uh, um, you know, something uh, grander in the, in the, in the uh, order of uh, existence. And uh, hopefully you find it useful. If anybody's got some comments or feedbacks, feel free to give me some messages or, or uh, if you've got some suggestions, please let me know, but no trolling. Okay. Uh, that's for uh, Alchemists Anonymous. Uh, no trolling. Don't, I uh, won't tolerate it. There's no sense. Uh, so I think, you know, we'll find out uh, with Rocky Mountain readings for today. We'll be back tomorrow uh, and continue with more uh, uh, Mystic Tales from the Zohar, and we'll talk about the Book of Adam and the two accounts. Uh, So we'll see exactly uh, what the Zohar has to say on that matter. So till then, have a wonderful, wonderful day. I will be doing a broadcast later on today uh, with uh, my friend Steve Eisenhower in uh, the Spiritual Abuse series. And, uh, yeah, he's got a topic he wants me to cover and I think it'll be exciting. So if you're stuck out there in some form of, uh, 
uh, abusive Christian scenario. Um, hopefully we got some answers for you there. Keep an eye out for that. Uh, feel free to like this video, share it on social media. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. See you tomorrow. Bye for now.